Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you know, you're an important part of our EWTN family. And today is one of my very special shows that we have for you. We're going to take a look back at the whole year, 2017, some of our shows that were highlights for us. And um, all of our shows were highlights, but we just have some special favorites that we have yeah. that we want to share with you. And so I encourage you to get a cup of coffee or a cup of hot chocolate. Maybe you're on a little Christmas break in your home. And um, we really want you to enjoy mm -hmm. this great show that we're going to bring yeah, to you today. I, I hope you're finding some more time to relax in this Christmas season and uh, bringing in the new year in a beautiful way, in the right way, that you're being blessed, your families are being blessed, you're spending time with people, cherishing them, especially the sick, the ill, um, visiting them, letting them know of your love. And this time, you're talking about looking back in the year and seeing some shows. I'm going to be looking at shows in the area of personal testimonies and, and witness of life issues and evangelization through the arts. But I always like this time of year to go through my calendar, my 2017 calendar. I hope you have some kind of a calendar because there's just appointments and things highlighted. And you go through that to know what happened to you in 2017, never mind what went on in our country, throughout the world. You know, as I go through the calendar, I see, oh, well, he here's birthdays and here's baptisms, here's confirmations, here's weddings, here's the birth of new babies, here's sickness, illness death um funerals uh, yeah and you, you just you and you, you just got to take that in once again and, and just give the people give everything up to god and say lord thank you for bringing us through this year and and in some of the sadder things you know we have we have hope mm -hmm. we're yearning for your kingdom to come your will to be done you know for everything that happened in 2017 and then to really prayerfully maybe in eucharistic adoration say lord is there anything in particular you want from me for 2018 and make it realistic don't pick you know 59 different things and and all this that you're going to do but just get listen to the lord and just see what he wants from you uh, but but aim at something you know in your own personal life or prayer life or relationships or getting in touch with somebody and and saying i'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, going to confession for the first time maybe in a long time whatever it is and uh because if you aim at nothing you're sure to hit it if you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. Aim at something. Even if you come up a little bit short, mm -hmm. uh, that 2018, you'll be a better person uh, than you were in 2017. Well, I think for me in 2017, one of the highlights of my year, one of the things I know that the Lord asked me to do was to try and reach out to one of my sisters. And um, so we made that possible and uh, had a trip. And my two daughters, Anna and Rebecca, came with me to New Jersey. And I just wanted to see her face it's been a broken fractured relationship and i just tried to see her and tell her that i love her and i just wanted to tell her that um and so that was it was a simple thing but it was a big thing you know it and is, yeah. and um as much as it is within my power to be as reconciled to her as i possibly can yeah. so maybe there's people in your life that maybe you are in broken relationships with in 2017 yeah. where you say as i go forward lord as best it's in my power, I want to reconcile and heal a relationship maybe with a family member. Or I, I know God has not stopped saying this to me um, from out of my adoration with um, joy. I want to increase your virtues and decrease your Amen. vices. Amen. He has not said anything new yeah. since then. So I'm sure I'll, I'm, I'm a work in progress for sure. And we're all grateful for EWTN, for Mother Angelica, for her vision for those people in leadership carrying this on through Michael Warsaw, Doug Keck, others, and for all of our producers and directors and floor people and cameramen and, and sound people and everybody who makes At Home With Jim and Joy possible and for you making EWTN possible to bring it to our country, to all the nations of the world, that all together we might build a new culture of life, marriage, and the family. There's plenty more to come. It's a year in review. Please don't go away. We'll be right back.
Well, welcome back as we celebrate this uh, Christmas season and, and the new year with you. You're going to see some short clips from some very special shows that really come under the title Inspirational Testimonies. You'll see Joan Ann Scheidler, incredible historic pro-life leaders, Immaculate Ilbegiza, who suffered so much in the Rwandan um, really Holocaust that took place there in so many ways, and also Dr. Haywood Robinson, a uh, former abortionist, now pro-life advocate. Um, so these are just some great clips from those shows, so very meaningful. We pray that you will be inspired what the power of conversion can do in your life and transform your life that you might be a witness for Christ. Let's take a look. Okay. So let's talk about how you all got involved in the movement. Well, Anne actually got it started. She had probably, they were going to have a rally downtown in Chicago. It was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. I was going to watch Notre Dame beat somebody. <laughs> and Anne said, oh, we all have to go down to this rally. Well, under, you know, the Pledge of Obedience and all that, <laughs> uh, we got the three boys and we all went down to the rally. And as we were approaching the rally site where Henry Hyde was speaking, mm, remember Henry Hyde, yeah. the great pro-life uh, representative? Anyway, uh, they handed us life and death, which was put up by the Wilkies, Jack yeah. and Wilkie, right. mm -hmm. and his right. member of his group. Yep. And it had a picture of a, a black bag full of babies. Mm. And they handed us that. And as soon as I saw those babies in a bag, mm -hmm. they'd all been killed in abortion. Mm -hmm. It was a hospital in Toronto because it wasn't legal here in the United States. And one of the little babies looked like Eric's baby mm. picture. Mm. And it just became very personal to me. So when we got to the rally site, I listened to every word. I talked to people about it. And then I could I became almost obsessed mm -hmm. that, that that could never happen in America. Mm -hmm. Although they were trying to pass a law in Illinois, but we thought it would never pass because we down to Springfield mm -hmm. and lobby. But then when I was working for a PR firm mm -hmm. when it became legal in January 1973, and I started doing, going to the clinics and talking, you know, do it, doing it, everything I could, reading everything I could find. And finally, my boss said, you know, Joe, you're totally absorbed in this mm. abortion movement. He says, why don't you, we'll keep you on our payroll and you'll keep your insurance till your baby's born because Anne was pregnant with our fourth child. And so uh, I started doing pro-life work full time. And there was no money. There right. was nothing in it mm -hmm. when, the, when the paycheck ran out. So, but uh, he had told me, with your background in journalism and, and uh, publicity and so on, you can make a living at this. And so that was kind of the combination of things. But partly it was the, the little baby in the black bag mm -hmm. looked like Eric, and my wife was pregnant with my daughter, mm -hmm. Sarah, our mm -hmm. first girl. Kathy. Kathy, I mean, <laughs> and we didn't even know that it was a little girl. But the thing was, her protection that had been there mm. from the beginning of this nation was gone. Mm. She was nothing mm -hmm. to our government, and I was in World War II at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, she means nothing. She can be killed mm -hmm. just on a whim. Because if you read Doe v. Bolton, mm -hmm. which was not printed much, it was a Roe v. Wade. So you that's a Roe companion, this Roe v. Wade, Doe v. Do Bolton, v. Bolton together. It's yeah. in Doe v. Bolton that it gives the parameters, mm -hmm. abortion for the full nine months right. of pregnancy. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people hadn't read that. It was a right. footnote in, in Doe. And the, even the Chicago newspapers, they had four at that time. Three of them left it out, basically. Mm -hmm. The Daily News put it in, the Doe v. Bolton thing. And I realized that they could kill my daughter. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think mm -hmm. that a war can happen. Somebody can run after you, want to kill you, mm -hmm. and for what? So we knew things were bad, but how can they start? So when they started, I remember my father gave me a rosary in the morning and asked me to go to hide to a neighbor. I was one girl among three boys, and everyone wanted to see me say a friend. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm alive today, because mm -hmm. everyone stayed behind. So I went to the neighbor who was from the Hutu tribe. Not everyone was killing. Right. There were many great people mm -hmm. in that tribe. So they knew this man was actually a good man. So I went there, he put me to sit in three by four feet bathroom mm -hmm. with other seven women. Who had also come there to hide? Well, who came, mm -hmm. who one there because yeah. they just knew he was a good mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. And we knew now our, our tribe was being attacked. You know, families were being burned in mm -hmm. their homes. Mm -hmm. And some other people like my village, they were 
together. We're just waiting. Who is causing this trouble? Mm -hmm. So he put me to sit in this tiny bathroom, kind of against my will. I mean, what are you doing? Why? Mm -hmm. But he said, I know what can happen. He was an older person. He knew what this discrimination have done in mm -hmm. the past. So with other seven women, we sat there. We are complaining, at least for the first days. And at the end of the week, things were getting bad. Mm -hmm. The government have given order to kill everybody of my tribe. Mm -hmm. And I remember one man said, who was a government minister, he went on radio and he said, don't forget children. Mm -hmm. A child of a snake is a snake, a child mm -hmm. of a cockroach, mm -hmm. horrible things. So during those, the time we were there, I wish I knew how long we were going to be there. We, spe we stayed in that bathroom three months, mm -hmm. from April until July. And during that time, I really lived on prayer. I mean, the man gave us something to eat. He would bring us food like at night, you know, with leftovers of his children. Mm -hmm. He told them that we have gone. Mm -hmm. So he, he had to hide, to feed us. Yeah. And we stayed there for three months. When we came out, we found out, I found out my whole family was killed. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad, brothers, grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. But I have prayed so much during the time I was hiding. Uh, my spirit was like shielded. Mm -hmm. Even when I wanted to break down, I couldn't. I felt like something yeah. strange was covering me. Yeah. So when I was separating my dad, he gave me rosary. And that's what I did during the three months. Mm -hmm. I prayed the rosary from morning until night. It was the only way to be safe. Because if I didn't pray, I couldn't take my thoughts, the imagination mm -hmm. of what was possible. Mm -hmm. And on the top of the imagination, they were coming to search every home. So they were killing people they found in homes. I mean, they came up to five inches away from us. And by the grace of God, they turned around and left. Mm -hmm. So I was fighting anger and fear. Those were the, my worst enemies. Mm -hmm. When I was angry, it was, I can die out of anger. I was a monster myself inside. I thought I would avenge my family. Can't believe this is happening to us. Then I would think about how they might kill me. Fear would take over. Mm -hmm. I would be shaking out of fear. So the only refuge I had was to pray the rosary mm -hmm. from morning until night. I remember I counted how many rosaries I said. I said 27 rosaries every single day mm -hmm. from morning until night. And 40 divine mercy chaplets every single day. Mm -hmm. It took me from 6 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. Then I would fall asleep and wake up in the morning, grab the rosary again, mm -hmm. and start praying right away. Mm -hmm. So how were you introduced to this whole area of abortion? Is that a normal part of family practice mm -hmm. in medicine? One of the parts of the training or something? How, how did this take place? Yes, abortions were performed in the hospital, and we were trained to do that. Being on family medicine residency, you rotate through pediatrics, OBGYN, okay. and on the OBGYN service is where you would learn to do uh, abortions. Now, uh, we have to remember the procedure to do an abortion is the same thing we would use or do with a woman who had a spontaneous miscarriage, a DNC, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be used as an instrument of, of death. Right. And what's so interesting about this hospital, I just want you to imagine on the second floor of this hospital, you would have the labor and delivery unit where you'd have the joy of, of laboring and, and, and birthing and delivering a baby. Across the hall from there, you would have the nursery, which included the neonatal intensive care unit. Mm. But right down the hall from there was another unit where abortions mm. were performed. And that's just so schizophrenic because you have right here in one unit, you're struggling to save these little tiny babies mm -hmm. who are literally the same gestational age of the ones that was you're killing right yeah. down mm -hmm. the hall. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's absolutely crazy. But abortion is not uh, health care. You will hear it argued uh, by organized medicine that it is. Abortion is not health care, it's killing the baby and pregnancy is not a disease. It's a normal state of human Amen. development. Mm -hmm. You also have to remember, money is a very important factor here. Mm -hmm. It's a lucrative business, okay? It wasn't, you know, when I was training, right. but once you have the skill and a license, you have uh, abortion clinics all around who you can sell. Mm -hmm. You gotta think of these as abortion stores. These are not clinics. Clinics are where medicine takes place. An abortion store is a place where a woman goes in 
and pays money and has her baby destroyed. And the way it works, when the doctor comes in, you have no prior relationship with that patient. Mm, right. When you walk into that exam room, that lady is already laying down yeah. mm -hmm. on the table. Yeah. You tend to avoid eye contact because you know that's going to involve make compassion. Make a human connection. Make mm -hmm. a human connection. You get there, you sit down, and in seven, less than 10 minutes, mm. you have the procedure done, and you're out the room, yeah. going to the next room while mm -hmm. they take that woman, go and set her uh, yeah. in a chair somewhere, give her a, a little cup of orange juice and a graham cracker, mm -hmm. and then kick her out of the clinic without mm -hmm. her being one of the first things that happened after uh, uh, my conversion was that the Lord came and says, now you're mine. Uh, it's kind of like Damascus Road, you know, the Lord was saying, you know, that why do you persecute? Mm -hmm. Why wow. do you persecute my babies? Yes. Well, what he did, he opens up your mind. That's where the transforming <laughs> of the mind said, mm -hmm. he says, now what I'm going to do, you, we know your sins are forgiven, for abortion and all the other things too, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. if someone would have had a uh, just a scholastic argument with me about pro-life and m me not come to Christ, all I'd be is a, 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 a non-Christian former abortionist. Mm -hmm. God wants mm -hmm. an eternal Amen. relationship mm -hmm. with you. So yeah. once uh, I came to know the Lord, it was obvious how bad abortion was, but He turned us around immediately and put us and uh, the first pro-life ministry, which was the Pregnancy Health Center, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm still involved with uh, today. Mm -hmm. And that is, I believe, one of uh, God's beautiful instruments, which he uses to, to, rescue, to rescue babies. Yeah. Well, uh, that was just absolutely beautiful yeah. because, you know, all of those people's lives, first of all, what a privilege it is for us to mm -hmm. host and to get to meet these people from all over the world who have sacrificed much, who are trying by the grace of God to be obedient to Jesus, to live out the life that God has called them to live in their circles with the Shivers as beautiful and holy as they are in their long marriage and, and their big, great pro-life witness and Immaculate, what's not to love about her, and Dr. Haywood Robinson. You know, the, the Scheidlers, you know, making the point, when we saw these aborted babies, we thought these could be our children. Yes. These could be our grandchildren. It just brings it home. And Immaculate, you know, we don't have to hate and have a hardened mm -hmm. heart what Our Lady can do in praying the Holy Rosary. And Dr. Haywood Robinson, I mean, to, to think about the radical nature of conversion and this man that was used kind of like a, a soul breathing threats mm -hmm. against the church and, and Dr. Robinson, breathing threats and actually taking action against the unborn and now being such a great advocate for life. We hope that you are inspired. We're so blessed to bring these stories to you and we bless the story that God's writing in your own life. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. We'll be back in just a few moments. Jim and Joy on a special year in review. Our next clips are taken from The Life Issue. Sarah Swafford is here. She speaks about emotional virtue, what it is, how it works its way out. Father Lawrence Carney, who walks the streets, bearing forth Jesus Christ, encountering people, praying with them. All of this coming from a beautiful place of contemplation. And Melissa Oden, herself, an abortion survivor. Hope you're moved by these clips and we'll be right back to share more about them. Let's take a look. But the two questions that I think as human beings, especially as young adults and, and teenagers, that you're always kind of asking yourself is, am I enough and am, mm. am I ever going to be truly loved? Right. Wow. And I think that, Say those two again. Am, am I enough and am I ever going to be truly loved? And I know that those two questions, even in my own life, you know, I think the devil really likes to work on our I insecurities. You people, mm -hmm. I think you got and people 60, 70, 80 still asking yeah, that question. Yeah, I mean, oh, sure. like I said, you don't get to graduate from it, you know. And so, you know, when I say drama, I, I don't always mean drama, meaning, you know, just mm -hmm. like, oh, like silly cat fights. You know, mm -hmm. that's not really what I mean. I think what I mean by that is 
just that longing in our hearts to know and to believe that we're truly enough and that we're truly wow. going to be loved. And mm -hmm. when I watched social media and texting enter the scene, I remember, you know, I was 24, you know, 23, newly married, little kids, but I wasn't so far removed from that life to, to wonder, man, what is this doing to their self-worth and to their confidence mm -hmm. and the men and the women? Oh, yeah. Because I think a lot of times people think, oh, this is just a female thing. We're talking mm -hmm. relationships. We're talking emotions. And the outcry from the men, like when I gave that talk to over 300 women on campus, the very next day, I had a group of guys come up to me and say, you gave a talk on like relationships and you didn't invite us, mm -hmm. you know, like, and it became very evident to me very quickly. Even when I, when I was on Life on the Rock, you know, we were talking about things and I got a lot of email from men that were saying, I struggle with a lot of mm -hmm. the things that you're talking about. And what is it? You know, it's insecurity, self-worth, you know, like who am I? You know, how do I build myself up? How do I grow in confidence? What does that look like in a social media world where you're constantly being evaluated, that the competition, that perfectionism? And one, you know, a lot of people will tell me that feedback on social media can be devastating. You mm -hmm. know, it used to be back in the day, someone would pass a nasty note about you or someone would say something about you in the, right. you know, in the locker room and it's like not the whole world knew, mm -hmm. you know, and with Snapchat and just some of the different things that are going on, it's really hard, I think, to, to see Am I enough and am I going to be truly loved at all stages of my life? How do we answer that? Right. That's where a lot of the ministry was born. In my conversion story, a lot of it had to do with a confession experience I had in the confessional with a priest. And the best dating advice I ever received was from this priest in a confessional. So when people tell you priests don't know what's up with relationships, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just drop, kick, you know, mm -hmm. silence them, mm -hmm. right? So, and this priest said to me, he said, Sarah, I want you to run to our Lord. And I want you to build a box. And I want you to take everything you're struggling with. And I want you to put it at the feet of someone who can actually do something about it. Mm -hmm. And I want you to fall into our Lord's arms. And I want you to let him love you like no human being can. Right. Because you keep trying to make all these men into your God. Mm -hmm. And you are always going to be disappointed. Because they, and you're always going to crush them under the weight of that pressure. Because no man can be your God. Mm -hmm. And he, he looked at me. And I'll never forget it. He said, Sarah, you don't need a savior. You already have one. Right. And it changed my life because mm -hmm. it totally reoriented, it untwisted what I had seen as what men were in my life. What what were they? They were supposed to be filling me up emotionally, mm -hmm. gratifying me, making me feel my worth. You know, I struggled with that so much in high school. And, and so then whenever, after I had that experience, uh, and he said, run to our Lord, fall into his arms, and then run with him. Mm -hmm. And run with our Lord. Don't look in any other direction. And when you feel like the time's right, glance to the side and see who's running with you. And maybe that's who you're supposed to be with, mm -hmm. you know? And it really reoriented my idea of, you know, Father Jacques Philippe talks about the re-education of your soul. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think we need like a re-education of our emotions and of our passions and of our feelings and um, just that idea of I can't take a person and make them my everything and I can't take a person and make them my savior because that's not their job. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and this priest said, let men be men and let God be God. In the afternoon, I start walking around and I just pray the rosary and I carry this crucifix, which is an old passionist crucifix. Mm. And when people smile or wave or honk, or sometimes even if they don't, I'll give them a blessing. And when I first started, I had a cross different than this in my little sash here. And I started to read a book called The True Devotion by St. Louis de Montfort. And I was at a stop sign, a stoplight, excuse me, and it said, the apostles in the latter times will carry a crucifix in their right hand and a rosary in their left. So I put the book back into my backpack and thought, wow, let's try this. <laughs> so when I pulled this out and people honked, instead of waving hello, I would hold up the cross. Mm -hmm. And then that developed into giving a blessing. There's a book called Insigne Jesu, which is St. John uh, laying on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper on the heart of Jesus, in the bosom of Christ. And the author of this book talks about how important a priestly blessing is. Mm. And it was revealed to this priest that we should give out our blessing liberally as priests because it has such a great effect. It's simply the Trinity using us priests as instruments to give his blessing to people. Mm. All of us are created to be in union with God. And sometimes it's important for those that are called by God to go share that contemplation. A priest has the ability to be set apart, to give his life over to God. And for my part, I like to think of the 15 mysteries of the rosary when I pray. And as I'm contemplating Jesus walking with the cross or whatever it is, if someone interrupts me, 
I stop my contemplation and share it with them. So St. Thomas talks about how the life of contemplation is probably the highest calling. And he even makes a distinction that apostolic contemplation is not having any activity just in general, but to share the contemplation that we have with God, our union with God. I pray a lot for a virtue called prudence, and there's parts of prudence. One of them is called providence. So my mission is very simple. I go and walk, and I rely on providence. What's so neat about the virtue of providence is that it's God's timing. So there's so many signs and symbols that come together that when people see me, they, they bring, like, I saw you over there about three months ago, but I couldn't talk to you, but now I want to talk to you. Mm. And it's, I happen to be off work today. Mm -hmm. And you know what? These things, we can't really plan them as much. Mm -hmm. So God really gets involved when we just allow him his timing. You know, a lot of people know me as a pro-life speaker or an activist and an author. And, of course, what led to that is the very grace of God. But I survived a failed abortion 39 years ago. And what I know about those circumstances is that, you know, my birth mother fits most statistics when it comes to abortion. She was a college student. She was 19. She wasn't married to my biological father, even though they were engaged. And, you know, one of the greatest statistics she fits is one that isn't often talked about in our world, and that's coercion and even force. Mm. You know, we live in a society that talks about abortion being a choice and a right, but statistics tell us that most women don't report having a choice. And I now know that my birth mother had no choice. It was actually forced upon her mm. by my own grandmother. Mm. I was born alive. And as I told some high school students earlier this week, a lot of people call me a dreaded complication mm. of abortion, the child who lives. Right. Mm. And, you know, I wish I could say that even when I was born alive, people saw the dignity and value mm -hmm. in my life, but mm -hmm. that didn't happen either. Mm -hmm. I now know that my grandmother, that nurse, not only forced the abortion upon my birth mother, but she was present when I was delivered. And she actually gave the demand that I be left in the hospital room to die. Mm. Yeah. But I don't fault her for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I say, first of all, that's what this culture has done, right? Where people could make these kind of decisions about lives like mine every single day. And secondly, no matter what decision she could ever make about my life, you know, you've already touched on the point, Jim, I love her. Mm. I think people expect me to be angry or bitter or somehow jaded about this cross, mm -hmm. right? right? This cross that I didn't pick out for myself. Right. But I'm not. I'm so thankful to be alive, and I choose to love the people who intended to harm me because that's how much Christ loves mm -hmm. each and every one of us and calls to love other people in return. Yeah. The thing of who am I, mm -hmm. you know, when you're hearing it, and it's just so huge because it, it is your image, and who, who am I? I mean, that... that firmness within yourself and then all of a sudden you know what you did think this is like there's little fissures and all of this mm -hmm. so so what course did you take you know as you went down the road was it you know how did you look for yourself or how did you find yourself or how did you try and find affirmation or what what took place was it a disastrous road it was, it was a bumpy road I'll yeah. be the mm -hmm. first person yeah. to admit that you know I I was kind of that typical I mean, even before that, I was a people pleaser, right? I, I always wanted to make my family happy. I never wanted to disappoint anybody. That's yeah. who right. I am. Mm -hmm. But when I found out the truth about my life, I, I spiraled. You mm. know, I felt such incredible yeah. pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and especially when we live in a culture that doesn't show a lot of respect for the unborn mm -hmm. and doesn't have a lot of positive things to say about people mm -hmm. like me. You know, people say things not knowing what somebody else has gone through. <sighs> And so I would hear all of these hateful, painful things. And so I was ashamed and embarrassed initially. Mm. I felt guilty for surviving mm. because I kept thinking, why me? Yeah. Right? And, and I was angry. I was angry yes. initially. Yeah. And I think what I did was I turned that anger inward. Mm. Mm. And I hated myself. Mm. And so I developed an eating disorder. I struggled with alcohol abuse. My family had no idea. That's so hard for my parents. You know, I think it's hard for any parent. Mm -hmm. But my parents had wanted to save me from suffering. Right, right. And, of course, the truth brought about this mm -hmm. suffering. 
but it was part of the process that i had to work through and you know the beauty in that is that it now helps me understand the suffering that everybody goes through and how we all make mistakes we're all sinners we stumble and i just happen to be fourteen and in a lot of pain so i understand mine but in the midst of that the beauty is that god really saved me from myself well i love the three of those guests they were so powerful uh, so strong in their witness and all their beliefs. Sarah and the beautiful question how she had to ask herself, am I good enough? Every woman wants to know, will I be loved? And the priest who told her, don't look for a savior in another person, but let God be God. And I know that every man wants to hear that because sometimes some wives are wanting their husbands to be their savior. They're not, they're just your husbands, but let God be God. And then beautiful Father Lawrence, didn't you just fall in love with yeah. him? He was so wonderful. And how, you know, he said, let God do things in his timing and not ours. I really yeah. enjoyed being with him. Then beautiful Melissa Odin, who was just a survivor of abortion and um, just about how not to hate, how to forgive and how to get on. And then God using her life in such a special way to bear witness for life. Yes. Well, these are three examples of people making incredible contributions, but all of us together making our contributions, seen and unseen, all together we will build a new culture of life. Plenty more to come on this special edition, Year in Review. You're at home with Jim and Joy. We'll be right back. Well, I hope that you are enjoying our year in a review as much as I am. You know, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love for you to join us live right here on At Home. Maybe 2018, one of the things you're saying, I would like to go to EWTN. You could be a member of our studio audience. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Send them an email, pilgrimages at EWTN.com. Give them a jingle at 205-271-2966. You can also go to Hansville to the Shrine to visit Mother Angelica's resting place. And we would love to have you. Well, right now we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Joan, what do you have for us today? Well, greetings from Rome to all of you at home. And once again, it seems impossible to believe, but we are at that time of year when we have the end of the year review. A look back uh, just at the main papal activities. We don't have time for all the Vatican activities. So I'm just going to make a list right now. And as I kind of looked at the year past, I realized there are so many things I'm probably going to end up forgetting something, but maybe not the major ones. I think we first have to look at the uh, papal travels outside of Italy. We know he went to Egypt in April. Of course, he went to Fatima in May for the 100th anniversary of Our Lady's apparitions to the three shepherd children. And the Pope was in Colombia in September. And then, of course, his recent November-December trip to Myanmar and, um, and Bangladesh. And now the Pope also made a few trips inside of Italy. And this is the man who said at the beginning of his pontificate, I don't think I'll be traveling as much as my predecessors. But he was in Milan in March, Carpi in April, Genoa in May, Barbiana in June, Cesena and Bologna in October. And then if you recall on November 2nd, the Feast of All Souls, he went to Nettuno the American um, cemetery for the war dead in a city just south of Rome. And he made one of his most emotional anti-war addresses saying, the world seemed to be headed into war, perhaps a bigger war now than at any time. There were also some important documents, motu proprio, written by the Pope's own hand. Um, in September, there was one on liturgical translations and then a second one, but also in September, announced that the John Paul II Pontifical Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family will now be replaced by the John Paul II Pontifical Theological Institute for Marriage and Family Sciences. 
And during the year, there's an awful lot of important messages that the Pope sends, uh, sometimes through individuals, sometimes through groups, institutions, and so forth. Um, in July, there was a very important message to the G20 meeting in Germany, and it was about the principles of action for the building of fraternal, just, and peaceful societies. And the Pope said there were four things to consider. Time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. Realities are more important than ideas. And the whole is greater than the part. And then in October, a very important message to the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land, marking the 800th anniversary of their presence uh, as guardians of the holy sites. Then in November, the Pope had a message to the participants in the COP23 UN Convention on Climate Change, and he made an urgent call for renewed dialogue and a high-level cooperation among nations on this matter. And another thing he does all during the year, of course, he sends a lot of telegrams. Probably one of the most outstanding was to both Iran and Iraq in November, expressing the Pope's condolences after a violent earthquake. Then, of course, we have the annual papal messages, the World Day of Peace, World Day of Social Communications, Mission Sunday, the World Day of Migrants and Vocations, and not too long ago, uh, excuse me, the World Day of Migrants and Refugees, and not too long ago, the message for vocations. And then, of course, twice yearly, Christmas and Easter, he gives his Irby and Orby message. And I think I'd really have to point out, among the many appeals that the Pope makes, very often at the Sunday Angelus, two really stand out recently. One, during his trip to Myanmar, and especially in Bangladesh, where he asked for respect for the Rohingya people, a persecuted and homeless Muslims living in Myanmar, really without a land, many of whom are refugees in Bangladesh. And then, of course, we know of the Pope's appeal um, in December, in early December, that Jerusalem be an international special city with its remaining status quo uh, that the UN has uh, the UN has endorsed for it. And he said Jerusalem is a sacred, unique city for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And of course, this just hours before the U.S. president had announced that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, and soon they'd be moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So just a handful of the highlights of a very busy year for the Holy Father, Pope Francis. Back to you at home. Joan, we thank God for your life and all that you contributed this year to At Home with Jim and Joy. Uh, you are a great blessing to us here at EWTN. Our next series of clips are going to be evangelization through the arts. Michael Calapi is one of the foremost portrait photographers in the world and was commissioned by Mother Teresa to be her, her own photographer. She treated him as part of the family. Sister Joseph Andrew Bigdanowitz and Sister John Michael Wynn, Dominican sisters of Mary, the Mother of God, speak to us and share the importance of Christmas music to honor Christ and to introduce him to others who may no longer know him. Mm. Kara Klein, Christine Simpson, Maria Spears, well, they're his own music ministry. Creating music to reach out to other women struggling with various issues. So we pray that these clips have been very meaningful for you. Pray that they encourage your heart. And from all of us here at EWTN, my precious wife, Joy, we pray that this Christmas season and this coming new year will be the best one of your life. We don't know what the future holds, and that could be disconcerting, but we know who holds the future. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Let's enjoy these clips and walk into the new year together. And I remember one very profound moment after a day of, of working with Mother. Um, she had walked me to the front door. And in their particular chapels, they're oftentimes right situated right off of the front door. And next to the big crucifix over the altar are the words, I thirst, mm. which goes back to Mother's Inspiration Day and Jesus on the cross relaying that message to Mother that he is thirsting not for water on the cross, mm -hmm. but for souls to come back to him. 
So as mother is walking me to the door to say good night and thank me for the day of driving her around, she paused to genuflect at the crucifix. And she looked up and she said, look at him. He looks so innocent and pure. And I looked actually at mother because mm -hmm. she, it was almost as if she was grieving a spouse at, that, at mm -hmm. that point. And then I looked back at the cross and back at mother's face and she said, but look at him. His head is bent to kiss you and his arms are outstretched mm -hmm. to hold you mm -hmm. and his heart is open to enclose your heart with his. That's the great love that God has for each one of us. Well, mother believe so me, close. mother didn't have a photographer, <laughs> and she often said if anything had prepared her to go to heaven, it was all the publicity, mm -hmm. because she never desired any of that. She would have been very happy going about doing her apostolate without any type of publicity. And in fact, when I asked mother if I could have a sitting with her, if I could actually take her portrait, she said, well, I happen to have this deal with God that for every photo taken of me, a soul is released from purgatory. Mm. So you can imagine the kind of pressure I was under. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, one time uh, when I was photographing her with a sea of other photographers in Washington, D.C., she saw me in the crowd, probably because of my bald head, saw, saw me and she came over shaking her finger with a big smile, saying today the place was cleaned out, meaning purgatory no. was cleaned mm. out with the amount of photographs yeah. taken of her. But you know, I would say, Jim, that um, I really don't know the true answer to that. I think it was a tremendous blessing. I could see in retrospect how God planted that seed and me seeing the film in high school on yeah. her and having that interest of, of wanting to meet her and to see her and obviously to that quest of wanting to photograph her. Yeah. I would have to say she treated me as part of the family almost immediately. And as soon as she knew it was me requesting this opportunity to take photographs of her, I thought that um, she really responded in a very positive way all along throughout my uh, relationship with her. And I always was very respectful in the times that I was with her. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the intimate times without the camera are probably my personal mm -hmm. favorite mm -hmm. uh, of going into the chapel and yeah. she seeing my wife and kids and wanting us to kneel next to her and yeah sharing a prayer book with her and hearing her very deep speaking voice and her yeah. very high, beautiful singing voice was really, those are the type of treasures that I'll always have in my heart, her feeding the bottle to our, our oldest son. Mm. Uh, but all throughout that relationship, you know, she was always very open and willing to have me come along and, and document. Um, she was always very careful about uh, not... Um, going over the boundaries, making sure the poor were okay with me taking photographs um, and not for them to be in any way put out there without their permission. Uh, but I would say that that relationship, you know, truly she, all throughout uh, my time with her, she was always very inviting and yeah. treated me as part of the family. The CD begins not so much with a song, as a chant possibly you could chant it or just say it because yeah. it's the christmas proclamation mm -hmm. which i was a lapsed catholic and then came back to the catholic church and i can remember the first christmas because that is said especially at the christmas eve service where we go yeah. right. they mm -hmm. say yeah. that or chant that yeah. mm -hmm. share a little bit about that and the content of it you don't have to go through all of it but just what are we saying in the christmas proclamation what's the church doing by saying that or chanting that why did you select that first well, actually, it's it's a little summation of the two thousand the, the years of the church waiting for the birth of the Messiah. So mm -hmm. it comes from the Latin, which means basically the calendar. And the tradition was that the church would mm -hmm. sing this Christmas proclamation, going back through right. the the Old Testament, right. waiting, longing for the Messiah, right. mm -hmm. and then ending up, of course, with the the moment of you know Christ and and kind of going through the, the liturgical year to a certain extent, and that was very popular. And then at a certain point, it fell out of use. Mm -hmm. And then it was in 1980 that Pope St. John Paul the Great yeah. brought it back. Okay. And so we, we use that. Yeah. And, and many people will say, what a, what a unique idea. I'm like, no, yeah. this is very right. old right. In, right. in the church's richness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, but it is beautiful. It and that's why we begin. Yes, yeah. exactly. What's so powerful exactly. about it, I mean, when you come into church, I mean, you're starting with that, because it's saying like in the 21st century, and then it mentioned Abraham, yeah. <laughs> and then all these historic people, mm -hmm. and you know, you get the real sense, especially if you're not steeped in the faith, 
but this isn't just about fluff. And you got a lot of people <laughs> coming yeah. who, are, who are into sure. fluff. Right, right. And you're saying, mm -hmm. right, this well, is your Easter Christmas Catholic. But exactly. this, is, this is historic. This happened in history and in time. Yeah. God has visited the mm -hmm. earth. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, mm -hmm. and, and He's making history right now. And this is mm -hmm. where we date history. It's from date the history. birth of Christ. Everything before or after. It's right yeah. here. So. And the fact that Christ had this same flesh, it always mm -hmm. fascinates mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when anyone celebrates Christmas, they're celebrating the fact that God loved us so much to come down from heaven mm -hmm. and take on our humanity yeah. and live our life and walk you know, and and redeem the world. Yeah. But it's mm -hmm. it's so hard for us to grasp that, which is why I think Christmas is essential. Mm -hmm. We have to become like little right. children at Christmas mm -hmm. and dream of what heaven is like because we know Christ actually came down as this little child in this man. You can't have enough Christmas music. Right. You right. can't. Mm -hmm. Speak to us about Yesu joy of man's desiring of the song itself or the recording of it or... Do you know, thank you for that question. We chose that name, first of all, because we love that particular hymn. And then secondly, because it really is, we say in this 800th year of the Dominican order and the 20th year of our particular community in the Dominican order, it's very Dominican in the sense of the Dominican order has always been very incarnational. And so there is that aspect of, of the reality of life which is so beautiful and in that reality walks the Son of God mm -hmm. with the same flesh mm -hmm. and as as you go you realize more and more he is he's grabbing all of our hearts whether or not we know it or not mm -hmm. he is the only thing that will fulfill the deepest desires mm -hmm. and we know those deep desires and so many people try to fulfill them in so many ways so yes mm -hmm. the joy of man's desiring Plus the fact that it goes back to one of our favorites, to the great composer Bach, mm -hmm. who was a very religious man. Mm -hmm. And so it's part of, it's his music and, and the words, and as you follow it through, you're led into a contemplative spirit of the eternity of God with mm -hmm. the music just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just so yeah. eternal. I had been, for like the last year before we started the ministry, I had been traveling um, and, and doing a lot of work with other young adults, just singing and, and speaking. And I saw so many other young women that were suffering the way that we were. You know what I mean? That were um, wanting to be in their vocation and, and didn't know why. You know, they were still single, you know, or um, they felt lost in their lives. They felt alone. They were trying to be holy. They didn't know um, how to walk the road of holiness in today's world. They were right. str struggling with um, feeling like they were never enough or beautiful enough or perfect. They felt, uh, and like we were always talking about these issues mm -hmm. and we felt mm -hmm. so blessed because we had this, this household of each other and we weren't just living like roommates. We were living like a sisterhood, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And Community. so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's where there, there was this, this burden. Mm -hmm. Like the other women are struggling the way that, that mm -hmm. we've struggled, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we want to connect with them. Mm -hmm. Because we, we really wanted to start not mm -hmm. just even like a ministry, like here's ministry and go. We really wanted to start, the thing that we started talking about was starting a movement, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it is such a gift to have the, that kind of friendships, mm -hmm. that kind of sisterhood, you know, no matter where you are in life. Yeah. And there's a, we realize that there's so many women that don't have what we have. They don't live with, you know, other girls, if they're, especially if they're not in their vocation, that mm -hmm. they're not living with other girls that they really connect with. Or if they are, they are kind of those ships in the night. Right. You know, they're not sharing their hearts. And we're made for community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think when we saw that, um, for me personally, you know, and especially working in the health and fitness field, you know, these women, you just see, oh my gosh, like mm -hmm. you're the burdens that you carry right. as a woman mm -hmm. and, the, and the way specifically mm -hmm. that is women that we're attacked in this culture mm -hmm. was so That's in your strong. face right. that. And they're so objectified by the oh culture. Oh my gosh. And yeah. they don't know their value and dignity no. and worth. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's so much more for you, mm -hmm. but they're just mm -hmm. stuck in a physical image as to say, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get this perfect body and this perfect, right. perfect, which is such an illusion anyway. It doesn't exist. You know, exist. then I'm really <laughs> going to be happy, and that's not really it. Hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, the and then, go ahead. I was going to say, the, <laughs> the beautiful thing about the ministry, I think for all of us, was it wasn't this, we were looking out to the world and seeing, oh, they really need this. Right. It was we saw we needed mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we the Lord kind of brought it together, and we just keep each other accountable and really push mm -hmm. each other to be great, mm -hmm. to be what God mm -hmm. called us to be and to mm -hmm. call out the lives of the world. Yeah. 
And we loved it so much. We're like, mm -hmm. this is something, and we, you can clearly see it in the culture. Mm -hmm. This is something that we need, and we know that women all over the world need it. We need each other. Yeah. Yeah. We were singing for a mass in, Ohio. Um, in Ohio, and this woman came up to me after mass, and just, I mean, tears were just flooding down. And she said, you know, she said, I've been away from the church. And she said, I don't know why I came today. I just felt like whatever. So I came, and she said, Jesus touched me through your music. And she said, I want you to know, I will, I'm coming back now every Sunday. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that was, I mean, it was so humbling because you're like, you know, we go up there and I guess we're our own worst qu critics <laughs> for everything. And, you know, sometimes I think we don't realize how much Jesus can use us when we give our, like, mm -hmm. our fiat, like, mm -hmm. here, Lord, I'm yours. I think we're going to hear another <laughs> cut from his own. It's oh. called Ordinary. It's beautiful. <laughs> Silence. 